This video is the first looking at different methods of government intervention to correct market failures and focuses on the use of taxes and subsidies. Now taxes can be direct or indirect. Direct taxes are levied on incomes and profit. So those are the taxes that go straight from your paycheck or straight from what you earn as a business straight to the government. So income tax or corporation tax would be examples of those. But actually it's indirect taxes that we're interested in here because we're looking at how to correct specific market failures. And indirect taxes are levied on expenditure, which means they can be used to discourage the production of those demerit goods and the goods with negative externalities. So remember, these are goods which are worse for us than we realize in the case of demerit goods, or they're goods which impose costs on third parties, meaning they're going to be overproduced by the market. And so the idea of the tax is to increase the costs of production for the producer. And then you can see on the diagram that the effect of increasing the producer's costs of production is going to be to shift the supply curve further to the left. So our initial equilibrium point, if left to the market, is going to be here. And then the producer's costs of production increase and the supply curve shifts further to the left, taking us to a new equilibrium. And one of the most common errors that you see when trying to show the impact of a tax on a diagram is that people think, well, a tax makes fewer people buy the product. So that means that it's going to shift the demand curve to the left. But that is not the case. It's the supply curve that shifts. And the reason for that is because it's the producer that pays the tax to the government. So when you go and buy a product that is taxed, you don't go and pay the producer a certain amount and then go off to the tax office to pay the additional amount on top of that. You pay the producer and it's the producer who has to pay the tax to the government. So that means their cost of production is going to be higher and that is why that supply curve is shifting to the left, which takes us to our new equilibrium point here. But as a result of that supply curve shifting to the left, you can see that we get to a new market equilibrium at a higher price point. So price has gone from P to P1. And what happens as a result of moving to that new market equilibrium at a higher price is that we get a contraction along our demand curve. So the demand curve is not shifting, but the, the contraction happens along that demand curve as a result of the price going up. And that's what you're thinking about when you're thinking about the quantity demanded going down. So that's how it addresses the market failure then. It reduces the overproduction. It moves that market equilibrium, which was at this point here, and the output being produced was at Q. It moves that to a more socially optimal level. It moves it closer towards allocative efficiency because now these negative externalities are more being accounted for and the quantity of output is reduced here from Q to Q1. And another good phrase to use when you're describing that process is you can say that the tax internalizes the externality. It means that the producer is now forced to take account of at least some of these external costs. So that overproduction is going to be reduced. So that's how the tax works. But we also need to be able to discuss and evaluate the effectiveness of the tax in really addressing that market failure. And that can come from discussing both the positives and the negatives of using taxation in this way. So as well as addressing the market failure by reducing the quantity in that market and reducing the overproduction from Q to Q1 here, the additional benefit of using the taxes is that it raises revenue, which can then be used to help to correct other market failures. So think about the amount of tax revenue that's generated from taxes on smoking, drinking, petrol, all those different goods which have negative externalities and they can then be used to spend in areas like the NHS, education, um, environmental policy in helping to then further correct some of those market failures. 
On the negative side to the tax, though, in terms of evaluation, is that it can be very difficult to estimate the extent of that market failure. And that then makes it very difficult to get the level of taxation correct. So if you think about uh, the monetary cost of noise pollution caused by a building of a new airport, that's really, really difficult to estimate and to get absolutely spot on. So going back to the diagram, we said that the tax is going to shift this supply curve to the left. Well, who's to say that actually we'd want to be shifting the supply curve further to the left and getting that overproduction down even further and that this airport is having really significant negative effects on a number of different households. And so therefore we'd want this supply curve much, much further to the left and we'd want the quantity of flights to be much further down here. Or who's to say that actually the impact of this noise pollution isn't actually going to be that great and there's only a couple of households that are going to be affected and really the the socially optimal equilibrium maybe would be here rather than here and so actually this tax that we've put in place is having too big an impact on that market so it's really about thinking well, how do we get that taxation absolutely spot on well that's very very difficult if not impossible to get the level of taxation absolutely correct to perfectly correct that market failure and if we do get it wrong then we could say well that's led then to government failure but i think probably the best evaluation point you could make about the effectiveness of a tax is that it will depend on the price elasticity of demand and you can see that really clearly here with these two diagrams. So in the top diagram, we've got a demand curve, which is relatively price elastic. And you can see that based on the relatively shallow gradient of the curve. And when that demand curve is relatively price elastic, the impact of the tax when we shift this supply curve to the left is going to be really quite significant in its main goal of reducing that overproduction or overconsumption and reducing the quantity from Q to Q1 there. You can see that distance is relatively significant. And so it's having quite a big effect in reducing those external costs. It also means that it's the producer that's going to bear most of the burden of that tax. So the tax, the amount of the tax is going to be this vertical distance here between my two supply curves. And you can see on this diagram when demand is relatively price elastic, it's the producer who ends up paying for most of that tax and the consumer is only paying a relatively small portion of that tax with the price increasing from P to P1 there. Now, if demand is price inelastic, that effect is actually going to be reversed. So you can see now with our price inelastic demand curve, which is relatively steep in gradient, the quantity or the amount by which the quantity is being reduced as a result of that tax shifting the supply curve to the left is really quite small going from Q to Q1 here. So actually the effectiveness of the tax in achieving its stated goal of reducing that overproduction or overconsumption is going to be quite minimal when demand is price inelastic. You can also see that in that case, most of the burden of the tax is being taken by the consumer. So again, it's reversed. The producer is only taking this relatively small burden and the consumer is taking a much bigger burden of the tax as the price really increases by quite a significant amount as a result of that tax when we move to that new equilibrium point. And I think that's even more relevant to think about when you think, Many of these goods which taxes are imposed on, so goods like cigarettes and alcohol, are really quite addictive, which means that they're likely to have relatively inelastic price elasticity of demand. And so actually that, that tax is not going to have a massive effect in solving that market failure, and it's going to put a relatively big burden on the consumer having to pay for it. But just as a final maybe piece of kind of counter evaluation would be to say that even though it's not having a huge impact in reducing the quantity, well, that tax is going to have significant benefits in terms of the tax revenue raised on cigarettes and alcohol, which we said earlier on, could then be used to fund other areas.
Moving now from taxes onto subsidies, and the analysis here is going to be very similar, but with everything just flipped into reverse. So whereas taxes were being used to discourage the production of those demerit goods and the goods with negative externalities, subsidies are grants given to producers to encourage production of merit goods and those goods with positive positive externalities. So those are going to be the goods which are better for us than we realise or have beneficial effects on third parties. And the way that they work is they correct for that market failure by reducing the costs of production and shifting the supply curve to the right. So the taxes were just increasing costs of production and shifting the supply curve to the left, but this is just pushed into reverse with the subsidies. So looking at the diagram, the market equilibrium is going to be at this point here, and the subsidy works, as we said, by reducing the cost of production, it pushes that supply curve further to the right, and that helps to address the underproduction and consumption that will be happening in that market, and it moves the market towards a more socially optimal or allocatively efficient equilibrium where those positive externalities have been accounted for. So it's addressing the underproduction and it's moving the market closer to allocative efficiency. So that could be a case of solar panels or other renewable energy sources and the subsidies working there to help increase their use in comparison to fossil fuels and other sources of energy which aren't as beneficial and so it's correcting that particular market failure. Now the evaluation is again going to be very similar. But with the tax, while that raises revenue, which can be spent on other areas, the subsidy is going to cost the government money. And where there's that cost, there'll also be an opportunity cost of paying the subsidy in terms of what's had to be given up in other areas. So if the government decides to subsidise those renewable energy sources, that they'll have to give up money that could have been spent on other areas like public transport or subsidising culture and the arts, which would also have positive externalities. Another negative of subsidies is just like with the tax, it's very difficult to estimate the extent of that market failure and therefore get the level of the subsidy correct, which can then lead to government failure. So on the diagram, the subsidy is having the effect of shifting the supply curve to the right, as we've said, and it's shifting it by this amount. But who's to say that we shouldn't be trying to subsidise this particular product even more and increase the quantity further? Or who's to say that we shouldn't actually be subsidising other things more and actually this should be subsidised a little bit less and the quantity should be looking to be shifted by a smaller amount? And finally, just like with the tax, we can have a discussion about the effectiveness of the subsidy depending on price elasticity of demand. And so if you could imagine that demand curve being relatively price elastic, then it would be a relatively shallow demand curve compared to the one that I've drawn here. And the subsidy would then have a bigger impact on the quantity as a result of that same shift in the supply curve. Whereas if the demand was price inelastic, then that demand curve would be steeper than how I've drawn it. And then the same shift in that supply curve would cause a smaller increase in the quantity. So the effectiveness of that subsidy in terms of how much it's going to increase that quantity, which is what we're trying to achieve from imposing the subsidy, will depend on that price elasticity of demand.